So all of you are aware of the wonderful things that are happening in the United States, the revival that's breaking out there on a university campus. Praise God for that. Amen. And uh, my brother, my sister, we trust God and we believe that in our generation we will see many, many more such testimonies, even in our own country. Amen. I believe this is the time, and um, Pastor Cornelius spoke about it, where, where the gospel will be preached across all nations, and the Spirit of the Lord will just move. Amen. Exciting times. It's a privilege to live in time. I want to share this morning um, something that I believe um, God wants to do in our midst as a congregation. Uh, at the end of January, Tanitraya, uh, those of you who know this old lady, that's um, also part of the leadership of the church. She posted something on our leadership call group, and, um, and it was about uh, Malachi 4, verse, chapter, uh, verse 5 and 6, and I'm just quickly going to read it. It says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land uh, with a curse. And um, in this time, also Pastor Cornelius, um, also in one of his sermons about two weeks ago, he, he spoke about the scripture. And at that stage, he shared that this predominantly, or first of all, illustrates and speaks about the relationship between God and Israel, the relationship be between God and us as his, his nation, his people in the New Testament. But then it also speaks about our relationships with one another. And, uh, and today, my day with is Malachi 4, and um, I just experienced that God really wants to come and deepen and strengthen our relationships. Amen? I'm going to say it again. I believe God wants to come through His Spirit, and He wants to come to deepen and to strengthen our relationships. First of all, with Him as the bride of Christ towards the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, that our hearts will be connected, that our hearts will be intertwined, and that we will closely be connected as bride to the bridegroom. But then also uh, our relationships with one another in our marriages, in our, in our father-children relationships, in our relationships with one another here in the congregation. I believe the Spirit of God just wants to move and mend hearts and connect, reconnect hearts again. Amen? And so... Um, so I want to encourage you to open up your heart that, that God can do that in our midst. I told my wife, Siobhan, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you do that, but at the beginning of every year, you sort of figure out, you know, the goals that you want to achieve in this year. And, and I told my wife that I trust God that, that he will, that I will know God in this year lying ahead. That, that's my goal, because I know if, if that thing can click in my life, if I can deepen my understanding of who He is and my relationship with Him, everything else will flow from that. Amen. So you can, you can turn in your Bible to the book of Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And, uh, and we're going to share a bit uh, from the book of Malachi. Now, this is a special book to me. Uh, when I was in grade one, Diego, um, I got a new Bible and, uh, from my parents, and you know, I grabbed hold of this Bible, and I read, and I, and I discovered this piece in Malachi chapter 3, where God says, see, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, and suddenly the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple, and I was just mesmerized by the scripture, and I, you know, in all my boldness as a little lad, I, I stood up in front of the class and I read that scripture in, in front of the class. And, and so me and Malachi, we are like this since, <laughs> since grade one. But it's a wonderful book um, because it speaks about, you know, uh, the, the future. It's the last book of the Old Testament after Malachi. There are 400 years of silence, um, but it prophesies about, you know, God will send, send a prophet um, and we know now today it's in the person of John the Baptist um, to turn the hearts of Israel back to, to God. And there are promises. He speaks about the remnant, the small group um, that will, God will you know, preserve for himself and those who, who manage to become part of this new move of God, which includes me and you. God says that um, 
you know, there are wonderful prom promises. It says in verse 4, but, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing on its wings, and you will go out and leap like, like calves released from the store. So wonderful promises also for me, me and you locked up in this book. But you know what? This is also one of the saddest books for me. Because it is the last book of the Old Testament. It means that God has been dealing with his people for generations. And the last verse of the last book says, Your heart is not with me. I'm going to send yet another prophet, the last prophet, to turn your hearts back to me. Can you imagine that? Just think of all the miracles, all the works of God throughout the Old Testament. Miraculous things that he did in Israel. And yet, after all those years, their hearts are still not connected with him. And it, it sort of forms a cycle throughout the Old Testament. If you think of, of the story of, of Israel that was in Egypt, as um, you know, in, as slaves, and God rescued them miraculously. And in the desert, when they were you know out of slavery, they started to murmur. Their hearts disconnected from God. Started to murmur, and God said, "Because you, you've murmured now ten times, you're not going to enter into the promised land." And then there was a the next generation under Joshua's leadership. They managed to to cross the Jordan um, into the promised land. And then it, the Bible says. And after Joshua died, there was a generation that did not know God. Yet again, disconnection of hearts. And, and so we see the cycle in the Old Testament, you know, when it's you know, going tough and they're going through trials, they draw near towards God, God rescues them, and then they disconnect from God again. And it is as if there's this continued tug of war um, where, where God needs to draw Israel back but what we need to see that there's a God who desires for us to be connected, heart-to-heart -heart connection with Him. From the beginning, from Genesis, from the Garden of Eden, up to Revelations, His desire is to connect with you in a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. And we see this desire popping out again in the book of Revelations, Revelation chapter 2, where um, through the Spirit um, of the Lord, um, John is writing th these letters to, to the churches and he's writing to the church in Ephesus and he says that you, you are doing these things and it's great, it's awesome, everything that you are doing is great, 10 out of 10, but I've got this one thing against you, that you lost your first love. And, and I trust God that as he's moving in our midst as a congregation, that you and I will not be counted amongst those whose hearts are disconnected from Him. We are going into an exciting new season as the years will progress. We are part of that generation that will experience things that other generations have not experienced. But you know what? One of the key things is that you and I will have to stay close to the heart of God. Because the temptation is there are going to be so many things happening in the nations. So many questions that might pop up in our hearts. So many things that has got the potential to draw us away from our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And we need God's grace and we need to focus that our hearts stay connected with His heart. Amen. So I want to go uh, through the book of Malachi um, because it, it sort of illustrates to us I think in some aspects, um, some warning lights that we also need to take heed of. And so what happens in the book of Malachi, there are uh, three mirrors, metaphorically speaking, or, or three signals that, that God shows to say, if you really want to understand the condition of your heart, if you really want to know what's really going in your heart, and if your heart is connected with my, my heart, these are some of the things that you can look at that will give you an indication of what the true condition of your heart is. Now, this is important for me and you because we know, Kieran, that our hearts can be so deceiving. We can think that we are okay, but actually we're not okay. We, we, we've got blind spots and we're deceiving ourselves. And this is exactly what happened also with Israel in that time. You know, they, they ask, the Lord is telling them, you know, you must return to me. 
And then they ask, well, where must we return to you, Lord? And then God says, well, look in the mirror that I put in front of you. This will show you what the condition of your heart is and why you need to return to me. And so what I just experienced to, to talk about this morning is that just out of the book of Malachi, to take that and to put in front of myself and you sort of three mirrors where we can look at the condition of our heart. And I trust God that, that the Lord will use this, the Holy Spirit will use this to show you in certain areas in your life where you need to reconnect with God. Maybe you're okay in some areas, but in other areas you're disconnected with God and you need to reconnect as we move forward into the season. Is that okay? Right, so, um, so we're going to, I'm briefly going to mention those three sort of um, indicators or mirrors to you. You can jot it down and then we're going to look at each one of them very carefully. The first one is the questioning of God's love and His presence. The questioning of God's love and His presence, number one. Number two is the way in which you and I handle material, material things. The way in which you and I handle um, material things. That's number two. That's the second mirror or indicator. And then the third indicator is our relationships with one another. Uh, that's the third indicator or mirror that we can put in front of us to show us what is the condition of our heart. How close is our heart with, um, connected to the heart of the bridegroom? Right, so let's start. The first one is the questioning of God's love and his, um, his presence, his involvement. And oftentimes in the context of looking at many things happening in the environment, that does not make sense. And that put a question mark be behind God's love and his involvement and his presence in our lives. Right. And so um, let's read uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, or verse 2 rather, I have loved you. God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. God is opening up this, this, this uh, book of Malachi and he says, I have loved you. And then Israel's response is, how have you loved us? Now, this is bad, no? Nah? I mean, how many questions do you have to carry in your heart when God tells you, I love you, and you say, well, okay, but how have you loved me? I don't see it. I question that. And that's the condition of the heart. The, the second um, verse is um, chapter 3, verse 14. And it, um, in verse 13 it says, Yet you ask, what have we said against you? Um, Israel is asking that to God, and then God answers. He says, you have said... It is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out His requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we can call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. So what these guys are actually saying, and, and it was really like that, a lot of corruption happened um, in, in that time, in the time of Malachi. And they were looking at the corruption, and they were looking at the people that were involved in the corruption, and they said, well, those people are prospering, those people are having good lives, those people are getting away with the corruption. What use is it to, um, to serve God? You know, I'm being persecuted. I'm being disadvantaged here. Other people are getting away with their corruption. Um, it's going well with them. So what's the use? God, is not, God doesn't care. God, God is not involved. That's, that's what they're thinking. And therefore, they're asking a lot of questions because, listen carefully, it does not make sense. It does not make sense. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that, that sound sort of relevant to uh, some of the situations that you and I face, right, on a daily basis? And I'm telling you, more and more as we move forward in the years to come, there are going to be more things that will not make sense to you. The temptation is going to be there more and more to question whether God sees and whether He understands and whether He's intimately involved in your life. And if those are some of the questions that you are carrying currently in your heart, does God care? Does He see? Does He care about the, the, the corruption and the unfairness happening sometimes against me? Does He care? 
And the temptation is there to disconnect your heart from God. Maybe that's a mirror to show you maybe some aspects in your heart that where you need to reconnect. I had to go through that about three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. Some promises were made to me, just briefly the situation, some promises were made to me um, about two years ago, and that did not happen. And what was promised to me sort of happened in, in, uh, in other people's lives. And, um, you know, and I, I was tempted by this thing of comparing and questioning and, and asking questions about unfairness and, and getting angry at that and trying to, you know, tempted to take the situation in my, in my own hands. And, and then I had to make the choice. To ask myself, am I really doing what I'm doing as if unto the Lord? Is my life really a song of worship towards my King? Irrespective whether I get recognition from people or not. Irrespective if there might be things happening around me that does not make sense and that can aggravate me and irritate me and, and um, you know, tempt me to, to disconnect from God. That's something I had to face. And, and when I think about this, I, I think about the life of Joseph. You know, can you imagine your brothers um, mistreat you, throw you in a pit, sell you to uh, slave traders, you're taken to, to Egypt, to a different land, a different country, you have to learn a new language. And there, um, you know, you're faithful serving the guy that your employer, you're faithful, faithfully serving him. And then his wife tells a lie and then you lose your job. In actual fact, you get thrown into the jail. And then in the jail, you, you're also faithful. You stay connected with God. You bring accurate prophecies. And, um, and then the dude forgets about you when he needs to talk to the king, you know, to get you out of jail. Daniel, I would have been angry, man. That's bad stuff. But you know what? Joseph did not, that was not his perspective. His heart stayed connected with God's heart. Up to the end when, when his brothers came and he disclosed who he is in front of, of his brothers. And, um, and he said the following words. He said, even though you meant to harm me, God had a plan. I'm telling you, my brother and my sister, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter who gossips about you. It doesn't matter the unfairness. It doesn't matter the questions and the things that does not make sense. If you believe and you stay connected with God, He will work out everything for the good of those who love Him. I'm going to say it again. God will work out everything for the good if you stay connected and you stay loving Him and you're not disconnecting your heart and you're pushing in and you're making the right decisions and you're doing it as if unto God, God will turn it for your good and for the situation. Amen. May we stay connected even if we've got so many questions of things that doesn't make sense. Let it not pull away your heart from the heart of God. Amen. Mirror number one. Are you ready for mirror number two? Right. Mirror number two is, indicator number two is, how are we handling material things? Oftentimes that's also an indicator of the condition of our heart. So in chapter one, verse seven and eight, it says, well, in verse six, it says, but you ask, how have we showed, showed contempt for your name and then God says you place defiled food on my altar but you ask how have we defiled you by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible when you bring blind animals for sacrifice is that not wrong when you sacrifice crippled and diseased animals is that not wrong try offering them to your governor would he be pleased with you would he accept you says the Lord Almighty and then let's skip to chapter 3, verse 8. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. And then it goes on. 
did you know that the way in which we handle material things are oftentimes an indicator of what's happening in our hearts. Sometimes it's, it's so frustrating when we engage in conversations about tithes and offerings. You know, people tend, in the past not anymore, go into this big theological debate and conversation whether tithes is Old Testament or New Testament and you know should we do it or should we not do it I believe we should but um, and I think sometimes we miss the whole point because actually it's just the indicator of what's going on in your heart if Kieran comes to me and he visits me at, at my home by the way that you're not doing very often but I'm, I'm just saying <laughs> If Kieran comes to my home and he visits me, and, and Kieran is the guest of honor in our home, you know what I will do? I will take the tray, and I will first walk to Kieran, and I will hold the tray for him, and I say, you take first, before the rest of us take anything from the tray. And you know what? That's exactly what God is talking about. You know, it's, it's not primarily about money. It's primarily about the condition in your heart. And if you are sitting here and you, you're making calculations, okay, I will give that maybe on my net, not on my brute, um, and so on, and you try to wheel and deal with material things. I'm asking you the question as I'm asking the question to myself. What is the condition of your heart? Because I know if somebody touches God's heart and they are in love with our Lord Jesus Christ, their, art, their hearts and their hands are open. It just flows. It's not about theological issues. It's about the condition of our heart that's connected with the King of Kings and so in love with Him that, Lord, you, you, you are my everything. You have everything. I just want to bless you. I want to give this because I love you. I'm so touched by that story always of that woman in, in Luke chapter 6. You know the story. The prostitute. And she's entering in this home and it's Pharisees and high learned people around her. And Jesus is there. And she's starting to cry because she loves this Jesus who forgave her everything. And she starts to wash his feet with her tears. She starts to dry his feet with her hair. And then she takes a very expensive jar of very expensive oil. And she breaks it. And she pours it over the one that she loves with all her heart. And you know what's so ironic? The theologians of the day ask the question, what a waste. Couldn't we have sold this? For so much money, give it to the poor. Well, it's not about that. It's about a heart that's totally given over to somebody that's your everything. I also see this in the life of the early church when the Holy Spirit was poured out and God touched them and it was so fresh and so new and at the beginning in the, in the early church. You know what was the first, one of the first things that they did? They started to open up their hands and their hearts towards one another. Started to share positions. I trust God that He will start to do that. Amen. Amen. That that dimension will return in, in our midst. That we will be so in love with Jesus that we don't care about this other stuff. God will look after you. God is a good God. He's a provider. He will look after you. But let's not allow material things to, to rip our heart away from our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. You cannot serve both God and money. You have to make a choice. May God help us. So, um, so, why is this important? It's important because 
we are human. And sometimes, I'm talking out of my own life, I have to steer my heart with my possessions. To be quite honest, sometimes my heart is not in the right place in this aspect. But I make the decision to steer my heart with my possessions. Listen carefully, this is the principle. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So I've got a decision to, to decide where I want to invest my treasure. And there where I put my treasure, there my heart will be. That's the principle. And so, you know, to be quite honest, sorry, Pastor, I confess, sometimes I also don't want to pay my tithe. I also want to, you know, I can think of 10, 15 other things that I can pay with that money. I'm sorry. I know it's not you, it's me. Man, if I look. And then I say, no. No. No, Vipia. You put your treasure where God's heart is. And in that way, I steer my heart away from my sinful flesh that just want to have and have and have and have and have. If you apply God's principles, God will rescue you from yourself. Amen. And also towards one another. Sometimes God will challenge you. Sometimes God will challenge me. In actual fact, he says that if you've, if you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. Sometimes God will show you and he will put somebody in front of you with a material need. And he wants you to address it. Because that's oftentimes how we demonstrate also our love towards him. By meeting the needs in one another's life. If you've done it for what you've done to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. May that love, that I mention of love, be unlocked in our lives once again. Amen. So that was the second indicator, the second mirror that you and I can put in front of ourselves this morning that will tell us what is the condition of our heart. Right, the last one is our relationships with one another, the last indicator or mirror. We can go to um, chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. I'm going to read it to you. You ask why. It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith, faith with her, through though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God Almighty. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. And then the other scripture we've read at the beginning where God says he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children uh, to their fathers. Do you know that, that you cannot disconnect your love to God from your love towards one another? John says in, in um, 1 John 4, he says, if you say you love God but you hate one another, you are lying. It can't work like that. So this means that, and, and what Malachi is saying here is that one of, the, one of the things that will show you the condition of your heart is that you mistreat and you, you careless about the core relationships in your life. It doesn't matter. So in actual fact, what happened in the time of Malachi you know, the men divorced, and then they remarried again, and then they divorced, and then they remarried again, and it was a whole sexual mess up, if I can put it plainly. They just ran after their fleshly lust. That was the pattern. And there was no commitment in true core relationships. No discipline in that. And so... I believe one of, the, one of the indicators that will show you what's really going on in your heart 
how connected you are to the heart of God is the way you treat your wife or your husband. It's the way you honor parents, even spiritual parents. Irrespective. I mean, if you live closely, I live very closely, of course, you know, with my wife. It goes without saying. <laughs> That's a silly comment. But you know what? If you, if you live closely with, if you move closely with people, you see their mistakes. I mean, you're acutely aware of the, of the humanity and the frail humanity, their mistakes. Isn't that true? But God, God expects of you and me to even irrespective of our human mistakes and our fra fragility and the mistakes that we make towards one another and sometimes hurt one another, that we allow the love of God, that unconditional, pure love to be poured out in our hearts like Roman 5 verse 5 says. And through that, continuously honor, respect, keep covenant, forgive, reach out, mend relationships, Try again, and again, and again. That is the kind of love that God is interested in. The 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love that, that, that does not give up. That's not overly sensitive. That forgives, that keeps on reaching out. That kind of love. And so I'm asking you, my brother, my sister, and I'm asking that question to myself as well. If you look at the relationships around you, the relationship with your parents, the re relationship with your spouse, the relationship with us here in the congregation, with your extended family, with your colleagues at work, with your neighbor, what does it tell you about the condition of your heart? Have you disconnected? May God help us. May God help us. I believe this is important. Because if we understand who God is, it will also manifest in our lives. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that trinity, it's the divine pattern. If you haven't gotten that teaching from Pastor Cornelius yet, get that teaching. But that's the divine, divine pattern, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The honor and the respect and the serving in the divine triune God needs to, to find expression also in our relationships with one another in different aspects, in different forms. Amen. We need to reflect who he, he is in our relationships. In actual fact, John 13 verse 35 says, This is how people will know that you are my disciples. If you? Say it again. If you? No. Right. That's the indicator. How closely we connected with him and whether his nature has found true expression in who we are. So I pray in this time ahead as we move along that God will really anchor us in our, our, our lives in His heart, or our hearts, connect our hearts with His heart. When I prepared for this morning's sermon, and you know, I, I just try to connect and, and hear from God what He wants to do this morning, I just experience, I just experience Jesus say, just turn the eyes of my bride back to me as the bridegroom. And I trust that even if there's one sentence, five sentences, a portion of what we spoke about this morning, that the Holy Spirit will use that to turn your eyes back to your bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we, we just thank you that you never give up. Lord, you, you, you took the initiative when we didn't want to have anything to do with you, Lord. You took the initiative to reach out to us and to woo us to yourself, to draw us with loving kindness. Just once again, Lord, we just marveled by your grace and by your love for each one of us. But we want to come this morning and, Lord, we want to say we're sorry. We want to confess every place where we've decided to disconnect our hearts from your heart. Jesus, we're so sorry. We, as the bride of Christ, where we allowed other things in the world, worries and material things and issues to draw us away from you. We're so sorry, Jesus. We ask that you will forgive us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will 
guide us, that you will lead us to connect, to reconnect our heart with the heart of the bridegroom. We just honor you. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus and in that name alone. Amen.